Hey everybody, it's Pete A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions, executive producer and host of the Break It Down show. I thought I would do today's intro because Matt Balaker is our guest, and he was brought to me by another friend of mine named Brad Hutchings. Brad is an emerging, fledgling, sometimes terrible comedian, and a good friend of mine, so I'm poking a little bit of fun at him. I actually think it's great what he does, and he turns out not only he loves comedy, but he also loves guitars, playing guitars, refurbing guitars, and just... I wanted to take a moment to be grateful and thankful for Brad and, and who he is in my life and say that I never get enough of Brad. We always, uh, we always have fun when we get a chance to hang out. Brad introduced me to Matt Balaker, who's a comic. He's a writer. He's a former investment fund manager, has a gorgeous wife in a gorgeous part of Southern California. And he also has a passion for writing. And he and his friend, Wayne Jones, who's also a stand-up comedian, wanted to write a book honoring Greg Giraldo's life. And they did just that. And that is what this show is about. That book is called A Comic Story. And obviously, it's about Greg Giraldo. For those of you who don't know somehow, first off, if you don't know who Greg Giraldo is, stop what you're doing. Go to YouTube and watch him roast anybody. Watch any of his stand-up routines that are on there. They're wonderful. He's truly one of the best comedians of the last 10 years. Unfortunately, we lost him uh, to addiction. If you know who Greg is, then you should definitely go to YouTube and re-watch some of your favorites because you know as well as I do how brilliant Greg Giraldo was. Standard things. Rate, review, share. These things help the show grow. I swear I'm going to get t- new t-shirts up on the website today or tomorrow. If I have enough time, it will happen. So get a shirt, support the show that way. Maybe tell a friend, say, hey, there's a great thing. Also, I wanted to say this. I'm going to submit for the Pulitzer Prize for podcast. Look, it's a long shot at best, and it's a long shot with my eyes closed. You know, there's really big organizations out there that have a lot of budget for their projects, and and we, you know, we do good work around here, but competing against the whole team as a as a teeny tiny team, it's a, it's a lot. But we're going to do that. So if there are certain shows that you think are are Pulitzer worthy or our best standout shows from the last year, please by all means let me know. Either way, know that we're going to go for that and we'll see what happens. Save the Brave, savethebrave.org. It's critical that we uh, help other folks out and in this case veterans with PTSD. Yours truly has that. And we're always trying to keep each other alive, and that's what we do. If you ever are worried about the validity of a charity, let me say this. I put 100% of my stamp on this. I work with these guys. I know these guys. I am these guys. That we put the money that you donate to good use. If you have time, if your attention, your social media thread, your expertise, any way you can help, we would appreciate it. It would mean a lot to us and help us to continue this mission. Greg Giraldo a comedian story, and one of the authors, Matt Balaker, here, right now, on the Break It Down Show. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> Hey, this is Matt Balaker, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, Matt is a comedian, uh, also an author. He wrote the book, Great Geraldo, a comedian story with his buddy Wayne Jones. And Colin Quinn wrote your guys' foreword. That's huge. Yeah, he did. And we were just talking about comedy, and uh, Matt had asked me if, if I have done it and if I enjoy it and everything. So... Yes, uh, I like to watch. Like I watch Dave Chappelle's special. I go to comedy clubs often enough that I get my fill really fast. Sure. But yeah, I mean, it's something I do, I would say, half a dozen times a year, you know? And then I'll probably watch something yeah, pretty frequently. I'll watch, especially if I'm researching a comedian to have them on the show, I'll watch a bunch of their stuff. Nice. Yeah. So yeah. how does it compare for you when you see it live versus on Netflix? So my problem is that I've been behind the curtain. Uh huh. And, you know, like I was listening to some Greg Geraldo on the way over, and I'm like, set up, punchline, set up, punchline. And so I, I can't not see that now that I've, I've seen it. It's really hard. So, like Dave Chappelle, so it doesn't happen to me with him. Uh, Joe Rogan oftentimes gets me to not pay attention to those things. But, like, someone really good, like Anthony Jeselnik, uh-huh. I don't dislike him, but I don't get the same level. So I'll watch, I'll be having a good time, but I won't I hardly ever uproariously laugh, mm-hmm. you know? 
You've become like Lauren Michaels. I, I don't think he can laugh anymore, he said. Yeah, I mean, because you just, you've heard all the jokes, you know, like, here comes the misdirection. I already know. And like, so unless I'm able to suspend that, and I don't know reliably how to do it, <laughs> and I'm not in any way saying that the comedians aren't great. I saw Chad Prather, the last guy I saw live, with a bunch of other, um, like, uh, redneck, blue-collar comedy kind of thing. You know, they'd all work with all those guys. And they were all funny, but and the crowd was great. They were uh -huh. laughing. But again, I, I, you know, I'm a pro and I've, I've been around it too much. So yeah, like I, I go see Jay more because he's a friend of mine and I've just, I've seen the act and I know it. So it's like, eh, you know, it's funny. I have a great time, right? but, but it's not something that I can spend much time on anymore again, because I'm like Lauren Michaels and I've just, I've been around too much of it to, to be surprised enough by it. You well, know? well, now you can just read books about yeah deceased comedians <laughs> so tell me about your comedy career though before we go into, into greg and everything hey this is p day turner from the break it down show checking in real quick to ask you this john scott and i all support save the brave with our time our location our effort and our money each month we give a small amount do the same with us go to save the brave.org Click on the donate tab, pick an amount that you want to come out each month, and they will handle all the rest. I stand behind these folks. Thank you so much. Let's get back to the show. So tell me about your comedy career, though, before we go into, into Greg and everything. Sure. And, and thank you for calling it a career. <laughs> I, very generous of you. Well, look, it, it, even if it's a passion, it takes... No, I, I've made difference. thousands of dollars in it, yeah. so you know I'm big time, Pete. Yeah, you're big time. But even even if you get up in front of a crowd for no money and you're just doing an open mic or whatever, like that's not just an open mic. You're out and you're doing. It's like a, I don't know. It's not a hobby. It's it's something more than that. Oh yeah, you know, and I've done it long enough where you kind of got your frustration, or it's it's like the initial thrill. Yeah, you'll never get that again. But then it's really about crafting an act and being able to appeal to audiences who have no idea who you are yeah and then it's about building an audience but i think it's i mean the first time i ever did it was in the early 2000s okay when i was working at the conan o'brien show i was interning at the conan o'brien show and i did it sort of on a dare yeah because this other guy seth and i we went to an open mic and we pretty much everyone there had some comedic aspirations it, was, it tended to be more sketch writers right that gravitated towards the conan show but there are plenty of aspiring stand-ups and, and i never really thought i wanted to be a stand-up but just when i saw that open mic it was kind of like oh this isn't that impressive you know i mean it, it was because i'd used I'd, I'd gone to the comedy cellar a lot and i'd yeah. seen people like david tell and colin quinn and greg geraldo and i thought okay that i knew i couldn't do right when i saw these open micers i was like yeah i could craft yeah. a joke and so i worked diligently that week putting a few minutes together and they also had gone through like a bad breakup so you kind of have that like you animosity in your head yeah. you, you have a you have a source of material yeah and then fast forward a week seth didn't show up and i did it and I, they just called your names out of a hat mm. and randomly i was the last person out but no one was paying attention to me except for the lady who ran it and i got through my material and she's like, oh, how long have you been doing? That was really good. And I was like, oh, that was my first time. And, you know, maybe she says that to all the girls. I, yeah. I don't know. But I was like, oh, well, thank you. She's like, well, you're, you look, you know, you look good and you had some funny jokes. And then I think I did it once or twice more. And then I got into improv comedy. I went back to L.A. And that was fun, Pete. But it got so exhausting. Tried to coordinate with other people. Oh, wow. And, and then I, I came back to stand up a few years later. So that was probably like 2003 or four. Yeah. And then from there, you just keep working it then i think a good tip for any listeners or, or people who have a desire to pursue stand-up is run a show i ran a show for six years in hollywood and that's how I, in fact joe rogan did it that's how i met tom segura and christina p and a yeah. lot of the people that ended up helping me you know and then those people helped me get better shows and they also helped me get good interviews for this book yeah i mean if you create a platform one, you get to steal from everybody. And I mean that in the best way, <laughs> right. not, not jokes or anything, but like style and vibe. And you, oh, I hadn't thought about that approach. Let me use that for my own distinct joke, Absolutely. all those things. But then, yeah, also like you, you start to run into higher and higher level people in the profession. It's you're giving them something. Yeah. I mean, it's like, if you have a podcast platform or something, you're giving them an opportunity. Whereas like, if I was just a fan of Joe Rogan and said, hi, he'd, he'd probably be cool, but I, I don't have, I wouldn't have had any way to help him yeah right right So now yeah. i did yeah i think that's a good it's good advice for anybody in any kind of a creative endeavor or business endeavors how much value can you pack into what you're doing so that when people do encounter it audience high level comedian low level comedian everybody's like oh 
this really works. This is really valuable. You know, right. if nothing else, you get into the machine and you get to do your comedy and walk out the door and smile. Oh, and by the way, you know, you ran into Joe Rogan or David Tell or whoever shows up that night. Oh, sure. that's great. When you write a joke, do you ever worry that you've stolen it at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not when I'm writing it because I would I would never knowingly right, yeah, yeah. take someone's joke. But there's, like, for instance, I, I have a patent for a exercise device I created mm-hmm. with a friend of mine. Is it a jump rope? <laughs> it's not a, it's kind of, it's it, a it could rope. be <laughs> that like you put around and it was, and it was to stretch your legs and arms at the same uh-huh. time. Okay. And it's spring assisted. So it's yeah. like a Pilates machine slash torture device. Yeah. I had no idea, Pete, there would be that many similar, uh, you know, not, not identical ones, but you, you go to the patent office and, and you like the lawyer's like, well, there's this one that was created in 1914 that yeah. borrows from this or blah, 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 blah. And, and in a way, joke writing is like that. Yeah. Like, while you're crafting that, you just think it's funny to you or you think it's worth saying. Yeah. But then you're at the show and you see someone, oh, that's that's similar to mine. Or I mean, just heck, go on Twitter. Yeah. Like, I don't think those any news event, there's going to be 100,000 jokes that are 99% identical. The exact same. So, I, I mean, I, I think as... I'm less worried about it now because I think I have a little bit more of a voice. Yeah. But there's certainly parallel thinking there's how many people have gone through a breakup how many people have a wife that they complain about how many people have kids my kids inevitably there's gonna be something that's similar and i i think the more you make it about yourself the less you run into that but it's always out there is it more of a problem when you link two or three jokes together that gets harder to walk away from you know because there's definitely comedians that are accused of doing it and you see the act and you're like one joke okay but gosh this whole five minute segment seems really familiar yeah, I, I think it would be, but I mean, without knowing the specifics, yeah, I yeah, also yeah. think anyone who's putting something out on Netflix or HBO, for example, yeah. would knowingly rip someone off right. because they're going to be called out for it. Yeah. Now, maybe it's a matter of you have the wrong people around you who aren't calling it out, but I think more often than not, and, and maybe I'm just looking yeah. too nicely at it, I, I think, especially for the, anyone who's done it for a few years, I, I, I doubt many are knowingly ripping people off are there within the standard you know setup deliver punchline format are there any new jokes oh yeah okay i mean i i think it's a little bit like you know if you're making a cake they all call for for the (laughs) most part eggs butter flour right and it's like altering those ingredients just slightly can make a new cake yeah maybe you bake a little longer i i mean i i think that it's that way in in a joke and it's also like how you present it is different. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the people listening to you, their reaction could be different when they're 25 than when they're 45. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, there's so many factors that go into making a joke, quote unquote, new or not new. Yeah. That I, I think, yeah, I mean, it's, it's almost like you watch a movie, there's going to be similarities. Yeah. Boy meets girl, boy, da, 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 but it's how you present it that can differentiate one movie from the next. And I think it's the same with jokes. When you have your set and you're going to try out new things or whatever it is, I often see people referencing notes on stage. Yeah. Uh, never uh, like this is the performance, but you know, if they're <laughs> workshopping stuff for me, especially a lot of these guys that act like you're an actor, you can remember a whole yeah. fucking script. <laughs> yeah. What's going on. I mean, why, why does someone who's pretty high level, I mean, really high level, you know, comedy store. And you're like, you're referencing notes. What, what's going on? Uh, it's sort of, I mean, like LeBron James has to work out at a gym too. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it just, they're not going to know exactly what they want to say until mm-hmm. they're up there. And sometimes yeah. they might riff off of an audience member. And this has happened to me a lot Yeah, where you have a structure and it kind of throws you off your structure, which you want because yeah. you don't want it to sound like you're reading from a script. But sure. if you're like Neil Brennan, for example, mm. like at, at the, the comedy store, you might be preparing for a, a really highly paid show in two months and you got to work that out. Yeah. And if you don't, you're doing yourself a disservice. So that's why you put the set list on the stool with you. So you look at it and say, okay, I gotta, I gotta remember to do this joke, this joke, this joke. Yeah. Cause without that, it's very easy to fall victim to, Oh, I'm, I'm having fun with the audience. And then I'm going to do this joke. I've done 14,000 times before because I know that people will like it. Yeah. So I think, I mean, I get, or, or maybe they're just lazy. I don't know, but I, I think know. it's a way to help work out new material. Fair enough. So you and Wayne decide to write a book about Greg Giraldo. Yeah. And I met Wayne as a, uh, as a Canadian academic librarian. So I, I, I 
started this book around 2014, like started the, the idea for it. And I did some interviews on my own and then I realized I needed more money. And so I did a Kickstarter campaign and Wayne was a donor on the mm. Kickstarter campaign. And one of the line items I was raising money for was a co-author or an editor, you know, an, yeah. a, an adult in the room. Cause this, sure. this was my first book project. Right. And, uh, unbeknownst to me, some guy in Canada would be super geeked on Greg Giraldo. Yeah. And, uh, so we weren't really like, I didn't know him before that, but through this, we became friends. When you're gathering all the information, obviously, first off him and Patrice die in a fairly short amount oh, yeah, of time. Within about a year. Right. Yeah. So, and, and that may not seem like a long time when you're alive in that moment, but really a year, it's nothing. Uh, not, it's, yeah. <laughs> like you're like, holy shit, what's going on in the com comedy world? Who did you get to talk to, to, to pull out some of those unique stories? Good question. Uh, the one of the first people I talked to was a good friend of mine, um, Kareth Foster. In fact, okay. I met Kareth when she moved from New York to LA when I was running that show in Hollywood. Right. And then she heard that I was I wanted to do a book, and I I, I knew through her Facebook contact that she was friends with this guy Rick Dorfman. Okay. And Rick Dorfman was Greg Giraldo's first manager and a good mm. friend of his. And I knew he would be someone that would be essential i talked to yeah so it was a combination of talking to kareth who i knew really well and i yeah. kareth you know kind of do me a solid yeah can you email rick or call him just contact him vouch for him that i'm not just some idiot yeah. psycho or, right. or at least hide that part right um but then i also knew enough i knew many people like sure. I, I knew his friend jesse joyce who opened okay. for him i knew him a little bit because i did a few shows with him and then there were other comics i like uh for instance this guy brian scalaro who we didn't interview for the book because he knew greg but they weren't super close but brian right. knew people that were really close to him ah, okay. and he lived in new york for like 20 years or something so it, it was just fielding your network yeah and then i think one of the big dominoes that i got from from rick dorfman was getting in touch with Marianne Geraldo, which mm. was is Greg's second wife, uh, right. but the longest tenured because he, he, he had a brief marriage in his early 20s. But Marianne was not a celebrity and obviously saw a, a side of Greg that fans didn't. And being the mother of their kids, yeah, she gave a perspective that was super important, Pete, because she was like the third or fourth interview I did. Mm. But the one where there was no fanboyish. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I mean, obviously she respected his comedy. It was clear sure. she loved him, but she talked about his pains and his struggles yeah. in a way that gave so much texture to the story that I was like, damn, I'm glad I interviewed her early mm -hmm. because her willingness to talk to me definitely shaped how he's told the story. Yeah, she informed you. That's great to hear. You know, he is a comedy and a tragedy at the same time. <laughs> yeah. And then and people who suffer from addiction, whether they're full blown addicts or just, you know, unable to get control of most of their life, they wreck everybody around them. It's like the one thing about that disease is that it manifests in everybody else. You give them the waste of right. the disease and it's just you know, you're like, yeah, I love that person, but arm's length. Or, you know, mm -hmm. I love that. I used to love that person, yeah. but fuck them. And it's Or just, you're like, in, in my case, I was like, I love his comedy. In my head, I was like, it would have been fun to like be friends with him. Yeah. And now I'm like, no, maybe not. You know, yeah. it depends like how close you are because you really open yourself up to getting hurt yeah. when you're close to someone with, with those issues. Right, right. And they're going to hide that. They have to protect their issue to be able to continue to live the way they have to live. It's yeah. It's a tragic way to have to be. But then also you couple that with his obvious comedic brilliance. I mean, he's just he's just fucking hilarious, you yeah. know. And it's what 9 years after his passing yeah. and even topical material he did based on news events, it has legs now. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there're going to be some like maybe when he's talking about texting that don't hold up as well, but damn, I mean to, to have that kind of mind. Yeah. And comedy is a very a lot of jokes are very ephemeral. They're they're not intended to last decades. Yeah. But he was so he he was so good at it that it was almost like second nature. I think why 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 was Beethoven so good at the piano? <laughs> I mean, I I think some of he, he did, his instincts were stronger than the average bears. I, I think that's what it was. Is like you know I, I see this with some some comics. They can they can take a news event for instance mm. and find funny things in it pretty quickly. And I think he had that, but also a willingness to continue to write and refine. And this is one thing I, I wish I was better at. Mm. Like, I think I'm a, I'm a decent writer, but there's always that revising and revising and tweaking and like not just letting it be. And I think he was really good at revision. 
and that could take a an A joke and make an A plus joke. Mm-hmm. I always thought that he was good. You know, when you do like a misdirection type joke, I thought he was really good at making the biggest leap that the audience could still make with you. You know, because uh-huh. when you rewrite that joke, you don't make enough. You're like, oh, that can go further. Sure. But when you're a bad comedian, like Brad, you make that. <laughs> No, just, he's great. Yeah, Brad's great. I, just, I had to throw a Brad joke in there. But when you make that turn and you make too big of a leap, like the reference is too obscure. Yeah. And it's it's not obscure. Like, oh, it's so obscure. It's funny, you know. But like Dennis Miller's really big. Yeah. Really gappy, <laughs> That's a good example. Yeah. Right? And, and and I I mean, I'm a fan of Dennis Miller's comedy, but I remember seeing him in San Diego once. And so much of it was over my head. And I was just like. And I, I think that was one thing that differentiated Geraldo from other yeah. cerebral comedians was just that he still made it about the audience. Mm. It wasn't like I'm going to throw out all these obscure literary references to show you how smart I am. It's, yeah. It was more based on let's have a good time and I'm going to conduct that good time. Yeah. That jump, that leap that he made, he also used his actual struggles a lot in his comedy too, where you just, you know, it seemed like it was very grounded, but also very not flighty, but just, it had a lot of lightness to it because of those jumps. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I think that is a result of his comedy being pretty honest to who he was. Mm -hmm. Like I, I I, I try not to have too many rules. I don't think there should be a ton of rules. I mean, cause there's gonna be someone who entertain an audience and, more power to them. But I think generally speaking, pe- people who are pretty much themselves on stage have better acts for mm. the most part. Yeah. And, and I think Greg on stage was just a magnified version of himself. And that was sensitive. It was intelligent and I think sweet. And I, mm. and I think when you're sweet, you can get away with saying more off color things Yeah, because it's kind of like, Oh, he's just, that's just Greg. Yeah. Or that's just Pete. You know, yeah. it's like it kind of gives you more license to push boundaries, and he wasn't afraid to push them. He definitely was not afraid to push boundaries. Do you think do, do those comedians get together? You know, the ones that really push things. Um, you know, fill in the blank. There's so many of them that do it, but like socially, I, I guess like you know Dave Chappelle. Yeah, he'll push. You know, uh-huh. and he'll he'll take people and make jokes about how they get offended and try to offend them at the same time, which just amplifies the joke. Does, do guys like Dave and Greg and gosh, I don't know. There's so many of them that do that, but do they all need to kind of be together and to kind of like, Oh yeah, watch this. And they're trying to one up each other. Or? I, I think there's a lot of that. Yeah. Like um, that was pretty evident on tough crowd with Colin Quinn. Right. Uh, Greg was a regular, but he, he was a regular with like Judy gold and Nick DiPaolo, Patrice O'Neill. Yeah. Keith Robinson, like Jim Norton, these really well-established funny New York based comics. But then it was competitive. Yeah. So they'd go out and it was in a way it was their laboratory. They're, they're testing ground to throw out material. Right. And, and I think it's almost like you might want to have the best shot in basketball or something. Right. You know, it's like you're trying to impress your friends to an extent, but each one of them helped push the other to a place that I don't think they would get on their own. Yeah. Yeah. You need to have that, that moment when Brian Wilson hears the Beatles and then the stones here and they're like, well, they're all trying to one up each other and find these same things. I cannot think of the comedian. I'm trying to think of the guy that got into trouble with the me too stuff. Very, very edgy. He always pushes it. Um, had his own show. Oh, and Benjamin. Nope. White guy, uh, middle-aged white doughy, very self-deprecating. God, what the hell is his name? He's huge. And he's just now getting back into the swing of things. Louis CK. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's also like not afraid to push oh, boundaries, yeah, yeah. you know, and and they've all got to find their thing. But did you? When did Greg figure his voice out? Do you think? A great question. I I, I think probably in the early two thousands, like mm. probably around when Tough Crowd started. Okay. And I think maybe Tough Crowd helped fine tune his voice. So yeah. I, if I had to put a date, it's a 2002, 2003, right. February okay. 12th, 2004. That's the that perfect time. But <laughs> when, right. when he started out and, and Jim Gaffigan, who we interviewed in Greg Geraldo, a comedian story said that when they started out doing open mics together, Geraldo wanted to be like Brian Regan, uh-huh. you know, sort of approach you know, in a way, kind of the, the mold of what Gaffigan is. Okay. And, and Gaffigan's definitely his own comic. Yeah. But Gaffigan, by contrast, wanted to be more like David Tell, mm. who was a little more ballsy and brash. Yeah. And, and that was kind of what 
Geraldo became. Yeah. Or in, in his version of that. You can tell there was, he was influenced by Attell, but it, it just kind of shows you they, they kind of crossed like an X. Yeah. And, and helped find their own voices. But even when you find your voice, you're always going to be influenced by someone ahead of you. Can you be a comedian at that level and live a healthy life reliably i mean like look I, and i'm saying i'm not saying don't they don't so. i don't know i mean it just seems like it's so hard for them to do i think you know I, you know most no, well-adjusted people don't want to get on the road 45 weekends a year yeah leave their family go to like you know some shithole club yeah and and maybe entertain few hundred people if you're lucky yeah and then you have to do it then you travel in the airport i mean yeah it's one thing if if you're doing stadiums and you're you're flying private jets and stuff sure. like that but you know why would you want to do that if if, if you're well adjusted yeah you know there's other ve- i mean even if you have those talents you could write for a television show or you could have yeah. a podcast i mean there's other ways so in a way it is it's kind of a strange and it, it's, sample uh, size even if you play those stadiums you were on the other path you know, you were you were out grinding. You were playing the comedy sir sure. and then the yuck center and the giggles and all these places. And and yeah, you have to go through that whole thing. And you don't know that you'll come out the other end and be able to just. There's so many. There's so few comedy. Um, like uh, what's his name? Mike Belzer. He's just. Is that his name? So Mike R- Belzer? Richard Belzer. Richard Belzer. Yeah, okay. hey, I don't know. If he's Mike not. Belzer a, he's not a comedian anymore. He's you know he's an actor. He right. Was, and so he's completely converted his life. Or like Steve Martin. I mean, there are examples of people mm-hmm. who, yeah, start with it and then yeah, mi- migrate elsewhere. And they do something else, or they get big enough that they can do only the projects they want to do. Joe Rogan doesn't have to do any specials. He yeah. doesn't have to do anything. He doesn't want to do his podcast. Is He's a podcaster now with a side gig calling fights. And then you want me to come, ah, you know, but only on his terms. He doesn't need to do it. Yeah. But it's an interesting psychology because he'll still be at the comedy store uh-huh. at 1145 on a Wednesday. Yeah. Working out stuff. So I, I think it's a calling. It's sort of a vocation. Yeah. Because it's like, if you're, if you don't scratch that itch, you're not going to be happy. Yeah. But when you do it, when you keep scratching it, there's going to be some blood. You know? Yeah, I mean it, it's it's an odd compulsion. I, I don't think it's it's like climbing a mountain. Yeah, yeah, and it's one of the few jobs where you can be uh, fairly. Uh, let's see, you get a very limited success by be very well known. You know, <laughs> well said. No, it's a good point. And and it's a job where at the end of the night, especially if you're far from home, there's hanging out there at the club with chicks that yeah. want to talk to you. And or, or going home, like you just left your own devices. Oh yeah, it's very lonely. It's isolating, yeah. and it can be really damaging. It seems like it's hard, like hard to get enriched when you like I have to perform tonight, so I can't get all crazy and go out and mm-hmm. do all these big things. You know, like I I can't get caught in L.A. traffic forty minutes right. away and miss. You know, so you're really limited on what you can do ahead of time. And then when you're done working, it's it's eleven o'clock. It's midnight, and you know, and you're like, there's nothing here but people that have terrible things to yeah, in their mind to a lot do, of you know? misadventure at that point yeah yeah yeah, yeah. they're not gonna go back and crochet right and, and it's not that you have to do those things but it is a very challenging life to stay you know in a healthy mental state and a healthy physical state because there are so many so many sirens out there oh yeah i mean we, we cover that pretty extensively in the book and one thing he and jesse joyce did was because uh, jesse was a recovering alcoholic or is a recovering alcoholic yeah and they would go to movies and when they're together, I don't want to say it's easy because I don't know yeah. their struggle, but it's easier because you have that support system built in. So they right. go to move and just kind of make it a routine. Yeah. But it just takes one time for some guy to be like, where are you partying tonight? Or if Jesse's not with them or yeah. you had a bad day or you're getting in an argument with your family member or something like that. And then it snowballs into like, Oh, well, they're offering me Coke and it's right there. And I know yeah. I really like it. So you're off the wagon. And that seems like from what I've, you know, cause I listened to, Greg do his comedy and talk on Opie and Anthony. And he would say, he have this story over and over again. I was doing great Mm -hmm. until, and then, you know, he makes two or three bad decisions. And then where it might just be a wild night for you and I like, man, we had so much fun. And then, you know, back to the regular life. That's not it for him. It's like it accelerates and he has no off. Yeah. Until, until it all comes crashing down. Someone, we, we interviewed a lot of people who were either addicts or, have addiction issues i don't really know how to yeah. define all of it but they say like the the longer you're an addict the harder it is to recover it's sort of like climbing a mountain that just gets higher and then they put boulders on it mm-hmm. and uh it just you know you can you can live 
clean and soberly 99.8% of the time, yeah. but it's that 0.2% that kills you. Yeah. Yeah. It's like shoots and ladders, but there's way too many fucking shoots <laughs> yeah. and they all go to the hole, but yeah. the very deepest, like they take the shoots and ladder board and there's like a flap out lower board and you're like, you're all the way down here, you know? And, yeah. Ah, uh, it's such a hard. And it's so. I mean, I'm sure you've seen this with a lot of, you know, lots of people. But I think you know, particularly in, in service fields, like yeah, there's some people that you can go party with, you know, they're crazy, and then they're just fine. Yeah. You know, it's it's not like they don't necessarily need it. And then there's some that is just always there. And yeah. and, and why why does one have it one way and the other yeah. the other? Yeah, it's yeah. Why right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's got to be genetic. I mean, I think yeah. we understand that, but there has to be some other aspect of your life because you don't just rely on your genes for everything. You know, there's no. like, I have a rule where, and I can break the rule, but like, I don't get drunk two nights in a row. Uh-huh. I just don't do it. That's not on vacation, you yeah. know? And then like, oh, someone's in town. But then like shortly after that, that little streak, if I do go two or three days of drinking more than, you know, a couple of drinks, then I'm like, I'm like, you know, it's no big deal for me just to walk away from it. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not on a train to go to more and more and more, but I do have this self-limiting thing of I, that you know? might be at it. It's it's sort of a self-preservation mechanism. Yeah, yeah. And, and another interesting thing we learned actually, a doctor told us this that we interviewed was mm. with substance abuse. There, there's a, a brain component, right. and it's not just that. There's environmental. Yeah. It's a sure. nature nurture to the nth degree. Yeah, but it's not as if the drinking causes the depression or the mental component usually there's something i think in greg's case it was depression you know we didn't diagnose it but yeah it appears as if that was the case and then so you take booze or you take pills to medicate your depression yeah and 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 that's the sequence not i partied too much and i i felt bad and then i'm depressed it's like no no the depression was first yeah yeah and if you don't if it goes unchecked right you get real hopeless and forlorn and all those things when you're talking to the people that know Greg as we're getting to the end, you know, and he had just had like, he's like, nope, nope, I'm good now. Right. Like yeah. he had just turned it around again. And then, but, but he hadn't, what did the people have to say about how they saw Greg's future in 2009? Oh yeah. And, and this was a common theme, Pete. Like they always say, he's turning the corner. Like you were talking about Louis CK. He, he was like that without jerking off in front of girls, you know, right. like, I mean, yeah. in, in terms of like what he could have been, Yeah. no, I'm not saying for sure he would have been that but i mean just look at some of his contemporaries like yeah. jim gaffigan gaffigan probably has more like acting chops yeah so so maybe he's more of a movie star but he's doing theaters he's making tens of millions of dollars a year yeah um mark Marin, huge podcaster yeah. you know in 2008 he wasn't as big of an, a name as he is now Mm-mm. even joe rogan yeah i mean Again, Rogan's, they're all different, but I yeah. mean, these are people who will now, I mean, we interviewed these folks, like they'll, they'll talk about how good he was. Yeah. A- and so I think as more platforms emerge for comedians, whether it's Netflix, Hulu, you know, Amazon Prime, whatever, yeah. pod, you know, podcasting is a clear one, there would be more people that would have seen him. Now, the thing is, counter that with, well, he still might have overdosed too, you know, like, yeah. and that's just... Well, yeah, that's my that's my next my follow up is is uh was this inevitable? That's a great question, and it depends who you ask. Like, mm. um, did in a podcast with Jesse Joyce, and and he mentioned like the weekend he died, he didn't have like victims remorse or I'm sorry, survivors remorse. Yeah, but he was originally scheduled to be there, but then he got a headlining gig in Canada or something like that. Yeah, so Jesse understandably went to that. Yeah, and what he said is. I'm confident he wouldn't have died that weekend right. if I was there. Yeah. Now, so if there's enough of that, maybe. And it did. Yeah. I mean, and for the most part, he wasn't a pretty happy place. But it's like you're happy, and then you're off a cliff. Yeah. So that's the thing. Like, in, in you know, in treating mental illness is well beyond the scope of this book, but it just shows like it's it's this constant. It's almost like exercising like yeah you, you got to do it all the time for it to work well and there's you know like for me going into into combat zones every time you walk off the camp it could be the last time you just right. don't know and if you keep rolling the dice it will be the last time yeah. at some point you just don't know you don't know and uh and either way the whole time the whole time i'm taking damage right. mentally physically emotionally you know so it's the same thing for someone like greg who doesn't fear 
I'll say he doesn't fear the edge. Mm-hmm. I understand where the edge is. Uh, and, and if my time comes, then it comes. I'm a lot yeah. more comfortable because I've been around a lot of death and everything. Sure. And if you're in that place a lot, they're like, yeah, this, you know, I've been suicidal, you know, where it's like, well, uh, you know, come see, come saw, whatever, you know, <laughs> yeah. and you can get comfortable out there on the edge. And so that the edge is, is not a deterrent anymore. Well, well like for a yeah, regular person, it, it, it might be exciting. Yeah, it might be exciting. It might just be like, there's just no point not going over here, you know, because I always come back, you know, and I, I don't want to make it like he's a autoerotic asphyxia guy, but but, but, <laughs> but the, kind of yeah. But I mean, like, yeah, you you play with that, you play yeah. that game long yeah. enough, and it can like, what happens if uh, he does survive, and in 2015 someone hands him a bag of fentanyl? Yeah, you know, he, I mean, because yeah. the 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 not that anybody would purposefully do it or whatever. Sure. But it's just that's the environment you're in. Like these things happen to people that consume drugs from heck, even regulated places sometimes have fentanyl in it. You're like, yeah. holy shit, it's all you know. So you take these you make these choices that open up that gate of of you know, death and it's just it's hard to see a way out of it if you're not able to I don't know, maybe if you got a different job. Like what if what if he did get on a, a network show, you know, and I think there's more accountability in those. Yeah. Um, and again, this is all what ifs, but yeah, I mean, there are plenty of, of drug addicts who are lawyers and accountants, Yeah, but it's a little bit harder to mask yeah. because you have to be at work at eight or nine or whatever. But if you're a road comic, you don't have to check in usually till seven 30, sometimes eight o'clock. Yeah. So you can be totally hung over and just in a bad place and, and pull yourself together enough yeah. to do some shows that night. And then you, fall off the wagon again and party super hard and do the same thing yeah so i mean there's some chicken and egg i mean maybe maybe you're picking that but he would have been a natural to replace john stewart on the daily show and john stewart said that Mm. he said that in interviews and so yeah maybe if he was hosting the daily show and not on the road as much it would have reduced the chances of him overdosing to death yeah but we don't know we don't know i mean and one thing i mean it's, it's fun to talk about yeah, but but I think an important message for for readers or people who buy it or just people who have a general interest in comedy is well, on one hand, Pete, there's what could have been. Yeah, but I think what was in Greg Giraldo's career is pretty fantastic. Yeah. Hey, this is Pete A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. Well, on one hand, Pete, there's what could have been. Yeah. But I think what was in Greg Giraldo's career is pretty fantastic. Yeah. And yes. worth celebrating. Like, even if yeah. you don't add another single thing to it. Yeah, yeah. Like, he he was arguably the best at something that is very challenging to be good at. And not just the best. I mean, look look at the admiration that continues to this day. Yeah. And, and, I, and I was almost saying, like, well, are you going to compare Beethoven to Britney Spears? You know, like, one sold more copies, but yeah. one is more revered. And I think comedically... Uh, you know, he, he, I don't like to throw on genius, but I mean, he's he's kind he's, of up there. You know, I mean, he's like a comedic genius. genius. Yeah. yeah. And, and and so, I mean, I, I just that and that was part of my motivation for doing this is just mm-hmm. put everything else aside. He had some impressive successes that should be celebrated. Yeah. And I imagine his ability to work a writing team, you know, if he was like John Stewart's replacement or whatever, I, those guys would have killed in that show. Not that John Stewart wasn't edgy, because all of that stuff is sort of edgy in its own way. But I can see a different kind of edge yeah. that he would have I mean, brought he to. He was, it. and then it wasn't. Then, it, then he yeah. kind of became the establishment. And yeah, and who's to say what Geraldo would have done? But one thing I loved about him is like he didn't play sides so much, mm-hmm. and he was willing to piss off people from all persuasions. And I think, <laughs> I think when comedy is at its best, that's what it is. Yeah, I'm gonna push you back on that a little bit with the whole thing we just talked about. How much does Greg get by on potential? Because we didn't see him. I think he didn't have a long career, but he didn't have a long career. You know, it's, I mean, in terms of like Patton Oswald has been doing this forever now, you know, yeah. people that have been yeah. doing it for 20, 30 years, they've had to iterate into some different form of who they are still the same person, but you know, they had to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. Did he have that capability? Does he, because he dies with so much, so much money on the table. 
do we give him extra credit for his genius as early on? There's probably some of the like Kurt Cobain aspect yeah. of it, where yeah. it's like, what if Eddie Vedder died instead of Kurt Cobain? Right. And like, I mean, I think we still respect Eddie Vedder now, but is he, he's not as revered or like right. Jimi Hendrix or something. Yeah, like yeah, that. right, for sure. Janis Joplin. I mean, there, there's there's sort of a romantic storyline about yeah this. 20 something yeah genius and, and in greg's case he wasn't 20 something but comedically he kind of was yeah yeah for sure you know i mean he was 44 yeah so it's like his best years are probably ahead of him right um and, and so yeah I, I think there's there's a little bit of that like you know over appreciation yeah. of the fallen but then i think after a few years and you step back and and watch his stuff it kind of goes you know the other arguments like no no his just stuff is just better you know like, yeah sorry <laughs> like, well, yeah. yeah but he would have had to adapt and, and i and i think he is such a he was such a prolific writer he would have adapted yeah i get the same feeling like it's you don't know what he would have done and the the age of the comedy special now i think yeah. he would have been fine i mean that. obviously like it's, it's as a fan it, it was personally really sad for me when he when he passed away yeah but it's also kind of nice to know like he's not performing in this era where so many comics just seem like cheerleaders for a certain cause or point of view. Yeah. And I don't think he would have been that way. Right. But I don't know that. And like, you know, you, you kind of see that happening. Yeah. Like, or it's, it's a lot of times it's the case with like rock stars. They get their money and then they just become so damn preachy. You're just like, dude, shut up. Like, yeah. You know, like, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> and like, so at least like that never happened. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess also to be fair, you know, again, when you live a dangerous lifestyle, like he often did, you can end up in the news in the wrong way. Like Louis C.K. Oh, yeah. Complete yeah. reset on his career and who knows where he'll end up next. Yeah. But you know, you can end up in the wrong bed with the wrong person. Say or, the wrong word. Yeah. Like some college student. And yeah. Screwed. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And all that. I mean, look at uh, Michael Richards, yeah. you know, hasn't yeah. recovered still right. and probably right. never will. Right. I may not need to with the money yeah. he's got, but yeah, it's a, uh, that potential thing is such an interesting thing to think about, like what they might have done, you know, and, and, well, and, and it's sort of, it. I mean, telling in a way that we're still talking about potential Yeah. when it's like, if you're a great actor or a great musician, generally speaking, like audiences were like, Hey, that's enough. Yeah. There's something, if you're a comedian, like you have to cross over yeah. to be considered a successful comedian. Yeah. Like is Robin Williams a better comedian because he was also a movie star? Yeah. I would say no. He might be a more broadly talented person, but not necessarily a better stand up. Right. Right. But if you got into a stand up fight with them, you would better be really Right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And same thing with Greg. I mean, it, when I I think about if I was to have a roast, I, <laughs> I don't know that there like I, I get it Jeff Ross, that's his thing, yeah. but if Greg wanted that to be his thing, he'd beat Jeff Ross. Jeff yeah. Ross is hilarious. Yeah, he's, he's great, great at roast. But Greg would, in a way that like guys like Pete Davidson can't. Greg yeah. would cut you. Oh yeah, he, he, had, he had a fearlessness. But I think also some of it was about his his vulnerability and sensitivity. Like he could get away with saying, yeah, I think more cutting things than someone maybe like a Pete Davidson who yeah. doesn't. I mean, and I think Pete Davidson's funny, but doesn't have that same kind of like aw shucks about him yeah yeah well pete davidson comes off like a a, a bit of a a dick yeah a lot of a dick right <laughs> and then it comes from one angle all the time whereas and greg work didn't it. care and even like someone like jesselnick that's kind of his shtick in a way mm -hmm. but it works yeah but greg was just different like yeah. he, it was a little more endearing i think who would you want to have uh roasting like if we picked whoever it's gonna be you like gonna roast you or whatever who would you want to get it from oh my gosh um great question people i know yeah but like if it was just like the best roast like i've thought about that like i would want greg draldo to roast me if he knew me yeah whereas like when he roasted chevy chase or i think a lot of the people he didn't really know yeah. and i think then it loses some of the camaraderie but like now like I, I did jeff ross podcast and it wasn't like a full-blown roast but like he took some digs at me yeah and i really enjoyed it yeah yeah because you know? yeah. i could tell like he was there he was doing it like it was fun. It's fun, yeah. And, and so, like yeah, if nowadays, like, I'd like uh, Colin Quinn and Nick DePaul, oh, basically Colin. the tough crowd, you know, yeah. if Patrice could come back. Yeah. Um, and Natasha Legero, because one, uh, I, I know her more than most of the people I interviewed. Yeah. And I knew her as just a really funny comic who was super oh, sweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when I saw her roast, it's probably like how a lot of people saw Greg who knew him. I was like, I had no idea she had that in her. Yeah. Like, when I saw her tear people apart, I was like, 
Damn. So I would like Natasha to, to roast me as well. What, what tricks, what tools have you picked up from Greg through writing the book? I mean, beyond being a fan, like what have you, like, as you got into him where you're like, Oh, this is really interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to keep this as part of my life. Oh, like comedically or just, I think either way. Yeah. Well, personally, not much because I think yeah. he had a lot of self-destructive tendencies. Right. And I did try to avoid those. Yeah. Um, but I, I think when one, I, as I get older, I, I'm trying to get more comfort in this is like not trying to be like an industry scenester. Yeah. Like it's probably to his detriment that he was, his friends were his friends mm-hmm. and he didn't really climb the ladder as quickly yeah. because of that. But I think that also makes comedy more fun. Mm. And now I live in orange County and not Los Angeles. And, and then not say like, I wouldn't mind blowing up, sure. But I, I try to have fun just doing comedy. Yeah, yeah. And I think he was at his happiest when he was writing and on stage. Yeah. And then, conversely, he really didn't give a shit about promotion. Mm. And that's something I want to avoid. And it's not naturally in my, like I I could probably promote you I, you better than I could promote myself. Yeah. Like like it's I have a promotional bone in my body, I should say, yeah. so to speak. But it's self-promotion is a little bit harder sure so that's one thing i i i know is kind of a struggle for me and i and, and i need to continue to do that like how do i toot my own horn more yeah yeah that's hard it, you know i've had to learn it too and, and it's just part of business yeah you don't have to do it but you have to account for the fact that you're not doing it oh yeah you yeah. know so and, and you're only uh, yeah. hurting like and they say no one else can do it for you that's like when i when i had my own show I was a fervent supporter and I promoted the hell out of it. Yeah. Like hard. Like I would go and give flyers to strangers. I would tell jokes to strangers. Like, you know, it was in a way pathetic, but also like what you got to do. But, but if it was my own comedy and I've done, I've promoted my own shows. It's just a lot harder to say, come see me. Mm -hmm. And and, I'm sure there's insecurity and there's, we'll get some psychology. I mean, there's there's a lot of issues there, but, but that's something that I've I've kind of, I I noticed from him. It's like, yeah, it's, he kind of hurt himself by mm-hmm. not doing that hard enough. Yeah, that I, I can see that being the case. It's just like like with my show. Um, I realized the other day we're about to hit six hundred. When your show goes up, we'll be way past six hundred episodes. And I realized, holy shit! Congrats! That's yeah, I, I, I'm in not just the one percent, like this the micro fraction of one percent. Mm-hmm. My, my show has an audience in eighty plus countries. Thousands of people listen to it, and it's largely undiscovered, which is amazing enough. But think about how many shows have to be created to get to where I'm at now. And I'm like, it's like, it's a lot. Yeah. But would I say that out loud? I mean, here I am doing it right now, but <laughs> if it's I'm true. being recorded. Yes. Right. And, and then like, in terms of like veteran produced military, you know, kind of podcast, there's nobody that's got a bigger show than mine. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Jocko show is more notable and all that kind of thing, but I've been doing it longer. I've had guests equally as big as his. So like you can look and you be like, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's you guys. And there's a few other guys that have huge shows, but, it's weird for me to say it. Yeah. You know, it's hard. What, what's that saying? Like um, comparison is the thief of happiness. Mm. And, and that that's stuck through. I mean, insecurity, whether you're a podcaster, yeah. a comic or a, a roofer, we all have it just to an extent. But mm-hmm. I think when we're at our least happy is when we're comparing our, our own accomplishments to someone who's achieved more because mm-hmm. we rarely do it in the other direction. Bono has this line about insecurity, like I'm just insecure enough, you know, and I think this is absolutely for true for comedians where you're not so afraid you can't do it, but you're so afraid that when you do it, like it only because of your insecurity, can you go on that stage and be what you are? Yeah. You know, cause you want to prove to other people and you know, you're never sure that you're good enough. So you're always, re- you know, and so all of these things make you better and better because you're just that un- you're just unsecure. That enough. Bono may be onto something. Yeah. Right? He, <laughs> he has might, a bright future. He might have figured something out. <laughs> if you were to add in a chapter that was Greg post mortem, uh-huh. what what do you think he would say? Oh, him interviewing? Yeah. Or- like if you would like, you know, yeah, he had his chapter like it's, you know, Is 2011. There- <laughs> what would he want to write? Why'd you spend so much time doing this book, Matt? I think that would be. Uh, yeah. No, I, I think there he'd probably want to focus on aspects that didn't involve comedy, yeah. aspects of his life that didn't involve comedy. We do a good job of covering the relationship. I mean, we do a good job of covering the love he has for his children and the relationship we had with them. Right. But obviously, they're not the 
subject of the book and that was right. never the intent sure. to, to make them that I, I i could see him wanting to do that um he, he probably had certain passions like boating for instance was a really big hobby of his mm -hmm. um he probably would like to talk th about that I, I i guess my way of answering this is there are non-comedic elements he would probably want to discuss and then i think just judging on how he reacted to some people who wrote about him in articles he would be appreciative because yeah. he always seemed really nice to those who took time to to write an article about a show. So I think he would appreciate the gesture, yeah. but he would deflect it in a way where it would be, you know, almost like a, a mini roast in a way. Like he, he yeah. wouldn't just be like, I deserve this book. I mean, he would, he would, yeah. there'd be a lot of kind of self deprecation. I think I can see that. And when you, when you think about someone, you know, post-mortem, if they're looking back and they really can't influence anything, what would they really want to say? You know, that's a it's, great question. Yeah. You know, like oh, I, I, the jokes don't matter anymore. Like this is yeah. my, these are my last 200 words. You know, uh -huh. what would you want to write? Like, what do you think he thought about, you know, when he does his last stand up? you know, if he would have known, would he have done something different? <laughs> he wouldn't have taken Oxycontin as I hope. I don't know because in his last stand up, when we interviewed people who were at the show, yeah, he talked a lot about, dating but also going through the separation um he wasn't divorced yet but they were going you know, yeah in the process of it and it was clearly on his mind so part of me is like no he would have been happy with that because he was true to what he was going through at the moment but then if you think if you knew that was your last show yeah he probably would have had more fun or you know like but i don't know how his angle would have changed yeah like yeah. he, he probably would have changed his material up now you know when it was yeah last. yeah so, but that's that's a good question it's, we'll have to ask him. The other, the other side. <laughs> we'll have to ask if you can him. get Geraldo on, please do. Oh, I'd, I'd like to hear that. I've actually had three dead people on the show. Wow. And, and I'm, I mean, 100% for real. So one was Mike Day. He was shot 27 times in Iraq. Died twice. And then just kept on living. What's his current status? Is Alive. Okay. Yeah. And but 27 times he was shot wow. with any variety of weapons you want. Like AK-47s, <laughs> 9 mils, blown up by a grenade. Uh, he killed everybody in the room. He first he died at one point. I'll say died because like he passed out, but somehow he reanimated. Uh huh. You know, and and they had put a bullet in him under his body armor, bam, point blank, just to make sure he was dead. So they gave him a make sure he was dead bullet, and then he came back, and then shot the other two dudes, and then walked out, and then died again on the airplane, and they revived. So he's been dead. This guy Josh Montz, he starts all of his speaking gigs by saying, "On you know whatever whatever 2008, I was shot and killed in Iraq." He was dead for. Ready? 15 minutes. Whoa. 15 minutes. What the? Just gone. And they were able to bring him back. What does he recall from that time, if anything? I, I, nothing really. You know, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, he'll, he talks about it. Not, we actually didn't get into that part because I tend to not like try to bring up the worst, per, worst point in a person's life, even if that's their, yeah. their gig. The one thing that is funny is the military is like, you're disabled, but not 100%. <laughs> like, dude, <laughs> I was dead. <laughs> Seriously. You could type for us. You, you could you, know? you could do our filing at least three days a week. Yeah, come on. No, they give you like a rating of like eighty percent or twenty percent. <laughs> you know, and like somehow he didn't just automatically like get the you've dead been full dead. Disability. Yeah, yeah you, the, the you've been dead bonus. Yesterday, the show hasn't come out yet, but yesterday we had a guy on named Jason. He was a cop in Phoenix. Got hit hundred miles an hour in his car from uh -huh. behind, and so it instantly blacks him out, and the fort, the Crown Vic, just goes up in flames, and he had fifth degree burns. I didn't know it went that high. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, you're not supposed to live. Okay. You have fifth degree burns. And it basically burned all the skin off his head and was burning like the bone. That's the fifth degree when you have to burn bone. Sixth degree is when there is no bone and the bone's destroyed. It's cremation. Yeah, it's cremation. So he was all the way like, when you see the pictures, that's a dude that's been burned to death. And then he, here he is alive still to this day. And it's bonkers. Like just to think that. So. Uh, I don't know that I can get Greg because he's pretty well done. Yeah, it's been pushing a decade. So. <laughs> but but that's interesting. Let me know if you do, please. <laughs> I will. What's next? I mean, like, you want to write more books like this, or what do you want to do? I do. Like, we're 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 in talks, Pete, to uh, to do a documentary and or a, a movie based on this. So that means it'll for sure happen because I said it. Yeah. Um. So that that interests me. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I think I have another book or two. I like the the comedy angle. There, okay. There's some people I've talked to that I may want to pursue. Like, you know, some people ask if I want to write my own. It's like, yeah, not yet. But, not yet. you know, maybe in the future. Yeah. You know, I want more living to do, I more guess. More living. But especially working on the audio book, I, yeah. I, I could maybe see a time where you just do an audio book. Yeah. But then in order to do that, you have to write it down. So um, 
may as well. It, it's it's painstaking, but the money also sucks. So oh. it's it's a perfect. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, you, and you're right. It's like taking all of that work to talk to all those people, some of them being convinced, deciding when enough is enough, because I'm sure you guys could have kept going. Oh, yeah. You know, you, it's never ending. It's That's ridiculous. The- I've got the project just like that. And I'm like, I cannot take any more of your wonderful story. Uh-huh. I don't want any more. Yeah, it's such a. And then you have to put it into something that's cohesive and makes some fucking sense. You know, how much self-doubt when you wrote it? On what? Uh, on, on like, am I doing this right? Am I doing oh this gosh. justice? I, it's more like when when wasn't there self-doubt? Right. Okay, I mean, and, and the thing is, there were moments where I was like, oh, this is really good. Like, the yeah. information was really good. Yeah. But then it's, am I presenting it properly? Yeah. And then, gosh, one of the best things we did is we, we hired, uh, hired this woman. Um, I'm gonna, it's in there. Um, Dorothy Halliday. Uh huh. She was our primary um, edi- editorial editor. Like we had other like pro- yeah. yeah yeah Dorothy Halliday, general editing. The first version we sent was so quote heavy, and one thing you know I almost wish I would do now is just have more indirect quotes, but nothing's perfect, you know. Yeah. And I and I never I never went in thinking it was going to be perfect, and that, and that was never. But I wanted to be good. But yeah, when we sent her the first draft, she was just like. This is the makings of a book, maybe, but it's not a book. Wow. And 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 I was like, we'd already been working on it for two years. Yeah. So at that point, I was like, this is the best thing that happened though, because we're like, oh shit, we 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 really got to tighten the screws. Because we gave it to some friends. Oh, it's good. It's good. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I like it. Not and editors. Like, not editors. Yeah. Not editors. <laughs> but this lady was this woman is a professional editor. And, and then after that, and then about a month before I knew it was coming out, you get the real like oh shits, and that's when we probably cut out ten thousand words. Wow. Because a lot of it was just like, you don't need it. I'm like, this really isn't that interesting. And then it's the the challenge is more what can you reduce versus what can you add on? And then you're hopefully left with only what you need and not a bunch of fluff. And you still got a 275 page right, right? book. Yeah. I mean, that's not bad. Damn, dude. That's... But it, it was the self doubt that helped drive me and, and Wayne to to make it a good pr- final project. Yeah, that's how the Prison Chronicles is for me. It's a project I'm working on. And it's I'm just like, am I. Am I doing this right at all? Yeah. Like I know, I know the material is there. If I can just get out of the way of it, but there's things I've got to explain. And ah, oh, man, it's just there's one chapter, and and you may relate to this chapter five. Uh-huh. Now it's called comedian's mind uh-huh. and i think maybe we had that it was just like a for the longest time we just called it chapter five yeah it's kind of like this hodgepodge of stuff and even like a week or so before it was published it was very different than what it became and i just never really liked it mm-hmm. and because it just didn't fit like i didn't yeah. really understand like where was the beginning middle and end yeah and, but i didn't know how to improve it and so we probably sat on it for almost a year maybe longer and then we had some interviews with people at the very end and then it became something I really like because that's yeah. when now it's, it's more about the psychology of comedians in general mm. with interludes about Greg Giraldo. Yeah. And it, it makes sense, but yeah. it didn't for the longest time. And I was really shitting bricks on that just because I was like, what, what's this one going to be? When people ask you, what do you do? What do you say? Cause you're an author, you're a comedian. I mean like what, what, trophy what husband, trophy husband. <laughs> it's doing a good job. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's so yeah, no, a, writer comedian right and Standard. consultant you know yeah. i work at, i've worked in investments I, I i managed a fund for a while i worked yeah. helping uh manage but what do you people. say though you go to a party what do you say i usually say comedian or or i'll say do consultant. you feel bad about saying comedian yes and no yeah because sometimes it just, like a lot of times i don't know if i feel bad it's just like i don't want the next question like oh uh, tell me a joke or oh, like it's, yeah is that hard you know it's like and it's also like if I was to introduce you to someone or talk about you when you weren't there, comedian and actor, maybe writer, author, they they require context. Right. Because right. I can say, oh, yeah, he's an actor. Like I'm, and that's say a good one, an actual one that does that for a living. Yeah, yeah. At, at a really high level. He actually, they call him. Right. You know, <laughs> it's like, do you have to set this Well, standard? the hardest thing, like, there was a, a couple of years where I made more money doing comedy than other stuff. And yeah. That's because I wasn't making shit doing yeah, other yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now I do some consulting work and I'm making more money than that right yeah. now. So it's like, if you do, if that as a percentage of revenue, I'm a yeah. consultant right now, but right. as a percentage of my time, I'm yeah. a writer or a comedian, you know, yeah. what I have the most fun doing is stand up. Right. Right, right, so right. It, yeah. In fact, I, I mean, I, I sort of loathe that question. Yeah. And it's a totally fair one. But yeah. I, I do kind of grapple with that. Like, I, how do you uh, answer it? Uh, it's so hard. 
feel like I'm a, I'm a podcast producer. I don't say I have a podcast because that like then I have to say, but no, no, it's a really good podcast. <laughs> They're like, yeah. uh huh, and I'm like, okay, that didn't work. Um, yeah. So I just say I'm an executive producer for podcast. I I make podcasts. I have my own, but I make them for other people. And that's what I say today, but I don't know that that's exactly, you know, and I don't want to say I'm a storyteller. Yeah. I don't have an ascot. You know, <laughs> you, don't, you don't have the elbow patches. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Well, listen, that's been an hour. I, I don't want to take too much of your time. I, I just, I love it. You guys should buy the book. It's called Greg Giraldo, A Comedian Story. And you know the deal. Buy it on Amazon, rate it five stars, give it a review because that will help. Matt and Wayne sell more books. I mean, that's that's yeah, ultimately you. it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, buy it wherever, Matt. Where where do you want them to buy it? But you should. It's yeah, Amazon's, Amazon's a good one. I mean, it's not Target, Barnes and Noble, um, but it, you know, Amazon's probably the the easiest, and I get yeah. the most for that. So buy yeah, and, and it also, and just so you guys know, if you're hearing this for the first time, that is where, like, if you can get your book to matter on Amazon, it will matter at Barnes and Noble right. and everything else at right. all. Works. And there's, I know you guys are all around the world listening, so I appreciate that. Greg Giraldo was a hilarious dude. Look on YouTube, watch some of his comedy, and then you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I should have bought that book, like Pete said. So buy <laughs> the book. All right, everybody. Thank you so much, Matt. For Thank you, time. Pete. I appreciate it.